I'm Ava Laura. And I'm Jessica. And this is Black Leave America podcast, where we highlight holistic wellness, travel, mental health, and self-care through traveling outside of America to reconnect and rediscover who you are. It's time for us to leave any condition that disrupts our peace. Black Women Leave America opens your eyes and explores new ways of living, but more importantly, new ways of being. Because sometimes you have to leave in order to find yourself. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Black Women Leave America. I'm your host, Ava Laura. And that's, or is it this way? <laughs> yes, <it does. laughs> And we are, our our guest today is Tanisha Barnes. I'm so excited to have her here. I have known Tanisha for years and we've actually worked together and she just has a fascinating story. She, she is literally everywhere. She's like the epitome of Black Women Leave America. Uh, So Tanisha, thank you for being here today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Oh, well, T Barnes is what they call me in these streets, you know, in these global streets, as I like to say. And um, I'm a global lifestyle entrepreneur, and I pretty much made that up so that people understood me a little bit better. That's what we do. <laughs> it pretty much just means that, you know, I move around the world creating businesses and uh, creating opportunities as a bridge between pretty much the diaspora and the rest of the world. And um, it's taken me on quite a journey. <laughs> yes. If you follow her, yes, you'd be like, what is she doing now? <laughs> I love it. And so right now, just kind of tell us like, because it is always something like what's going on in your world. Yeah, I call it T Barnes Landia. And <laughs> T Barnes Landia. Um, I mean, basically, it is, I think it's a um kind of the accumulation of all of my life's work, right? Um, I started out really young as an activist. From the age of 12, I was the president of the NAACP to the time I was 18 and my politics shifted. <laughs> and um, and then I, you know, I studied abroad when I was 16 in Russia. Uh, so that was my first abroad experience. And it kind of uh-huh. just shifted my trajectory, I think, forever, right? Um, so uh now I'm kind of taking these experiences. I, I own the core of my work. I'm actually a, a clinical esthetician. Um, I have a skincare line, a bath and body line, a, a cosmetic line, a candle and a clothing line. Um, so that's the commerce part of what I do. And it was the base of my business. Once I started getting into manufacturing the clothing line abroad, I was traveling all the time. And my customers were like, I want to go somewhere. I was like, well, okay, I'm going to plan something. So I started doing this one trip every year in January, the T-Barnes Global Life, or it was a lifestyle of beauty retreat. And Mm -hmm. um, that was 2012. And that one retreat turned into eight booked retreats every single year. And yeah, it just grew. And, you know, as I wanted to explore a new country, I would go by myself because I'm, you know, a solo traveler, I'm a lone wolf kind of person. And I would go and I would explore the countries, I would build relationships and I would stay for some time, like a month, two months, you know, at least three weeks um, and build the relationships and then create what was a deeper experience. You know, I'm a cultural traveler. I always tell people like, I don't really travel for the gram. That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to take pretty pictures just like anybody else. I am in the beauty business. Um, But, you know, the core of really what it is I want is to give Black folks options. I want us to have options. I want us to be able to understand that the world is broad. And I got that opportunity really young. You know, I I got to travel at 16 across the world. My first flight, international flight was 25 hours, you know? Wow. Uh, Yeah, I mean, Russia's far, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I went to Russia. I went to Russia like at the end of the Cold War. So, you know, but I had this amazing experience there. You know, it was before kind of like popular culture and the racism and things kind of creeped into Russia. So I was like coveted. People stopped me on the street. They gave me gifts. I was like, oh, like being a black woman in these global streets. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so my experience in the world really young, um, I think impacted me really deeply. And, um, and so now I am, um, I 
so during COVID, I've been running my beauty business, doing that, doing my travel stuff. Um, the all these uprisings, you know, Trayvon Martin was my first like, I'm out of here. Right. And I, I knew I was always going to be out of here. Like I never really thought I would. And I knew I always said I'm going to die in Africa, you know, because um, you weren't here like, anyway. Oh, so, you, you know, you're one of those people when I think of you, I'm like, where is she now? You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not here. <laughs> I mean, you know, but before it was like coming and going, it was definitely yeah. travel. You know, yeah. I was like, OK, my family is here and I, you know, I have a very close knit family. So like, you know, I was traveling and I and I was like, OK, this is great. This is a good feeling. And I think um, after Trayvon Martin, I was just like, really something about that impacted me really deep. I remember like I, I fell to my knees after that. I would cried so hard and I was like, I'm done. I'm out of here. And we moved to Anguilla. And I own boutiques in Anguilla. And I just, you know, I had been on a, um, a speaking tour around the Caribbean for the skincare. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go there because it's Black people and they're, they own 98% of that island. And that's where I'm going. And I was there for five years, you know, it's like on mm -hmm. and off and kind of coming back, but really spending a lot of time there. Um, and so from that point on, I knew, okay, the U.S. is not for me. And eventually this is going to be a longer term transition. The Caribbean, I always credit the Caribbean. It saved me. Like they, they mm. pulled me out of that. And, but then you outgrow that experience too. You know, the mm -hmm. Caribbean is also deeply colonized, um, you know, uh, for all of the wonderful experiences that I had in Anguilla, I also got to see that, you know, we're hurting everywhere in the diaspora. It's not just yeah. the U.S., right? It's a different kind of hurt. It looks different in the Caribbean. Oh. Um, and then I was like, okay, I need, I need to get back to Africa. And I've been in Africa. I've been spending time there, but it was really time for me to figure it out. And so now I'm running my same business, T. Barnes, you know, Global Lifestyle. I still have all the products on the market. I'm actually switched a lot of my manufacturing to um, Africa. Mm. And um, but so between Africa and Vietnam, um, I'm manufacturing okay. now. And the other part of it is uh, out of COVID and I created the Black Freedom Colony. I don't know if you remember that, um, but I thought it was gonna be a few people. Yeah, I know, girl, I'm all over the place. <laughs> I, I created this Black Freedom Colony. I was in Morocco during COVID. I came back because I thought it was just a pack to go back to Morocco. And I was like, oh, I'm trapped here. The border's closed, I'm, but I'm not staying here. And so I left and I, um, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to stay here. Maybe some folks want to go to Mexico with me and Solana. You know, I mm -hmm. got a few people, people always want to travel with me. So mm -hmm. it turned out 98 people did a full oh expatriation to Mexico, right. For four months, wow. I took over an entire apartment building and it wow. was a deep hurtful sometimes, but amazing experience in building community. Wow. Um, and so that kind of led to where I am, am now, where the Black Freedom Colony has morphed into what we're calling Nwasi Global Community. It's a Black Center community, and where we have a healing and restoration center that we're purchasing in Morocco, and wow. we have space properties in Ghana. So it's like this whole big um, way of creating bridges so that people can travel to the continent but also to do this healing work you know we've been that's how we know each other yes. you know, he, he yes. came in doing that healing work for yep. me and that has you know like I was doing a lot of tourism and how long ago was that that was a while back it was like five years six years I was I about to say about six years ago yeah I think I had there was I had gone through a lot I had been doing these deep healing work in Bali and and so most of my tourism now is around healing um, and so that's, that's where I am. Wow. That was very long winded. To... No, it's okay. That's fine. <laughs> no, that was great. How did you know you needed to create a place for healing? Like, was there a certain experience or was there uh, something that happened that pushed you into this new insight? I think, you know, I've all, I've been very, very sensitive from young. Like I remember crying about the black experience at like 11, you know, like being really deeply moved by what I felt was happening to our people, you know, um, really young. Um, so I think that I've always been kind of in tuned in and sensitive to that. And, um, and I went through some painful experiences and, you know, I kind of had to pull myself my self-esteem back like you know like I had to do the work and I did the work on me and it was beautiful and when you get to the other side of that you're like 
oh, okay, now I need to make sure other people have access to this work that I've done. And I don't know that you can really get to that work here in the US because you're constantly burdened by trauma. Like it, once you get one over one hump, it, it's coming right behind it. You know, you, you it's just constant. And, and I also think the energy is stale. You know, like I think God has been really guiding me to these countries. It's weird because I won't be interested in a place and then all of a sudden it'll be like really, really, really like, oh, I have to go here. And I don't know why, I don't know where it comes from. But what I started to realize is that all the places that I was being called to were spiritual vortexes, mm -hmm. you know, the Sahara Desert, Bali, like all mm -hmm. of these, Mexico, you know, and I didn't do Mexico like uh, Cabo, you know, I did like, <laughs> I found the folks in the jungle, the Mayans, you know. Um, so I think that I remember being in Bali at the end of kind of like a lot of my healing stuff. And we were on this mountain, me and my, me and at that point, my, my first healer. And she goes, you know, your life path is a number nine, Tanisha. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that means that you are going to be, um, a spiritual healer in this world, a guy. And I was like, no, the hell I'm not. I don't want that responsibility. I'm not interested in that responsibility. I don't want nothing to do. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm all right. Just trying to figure me out. Right. And she was, she laughed at me. And she laughs at me now, right? Mm -hmm. like, she like, oh, I know I what I know. You'll see. Yeah, yeah. So you'll see. <laughs> and I think even now I'm still like, mm, I don't know about this work, but I, I think what I am good at is bringing, I can bring the, you know, Avaloras to you. I'm very good at like gathering uh, the spiritual leaders and gathering people that can help you through. And I will hold your hand through it. I will create the opportunities for you to do it. Um, and, and so that's kind of, I think where I am in this, um, in this journey is like getting people through, but things happen, like it happens to everybody, right. Um, personally, but I, I've known we were hurting, like, you know, and when you travel with black folks, mm -hmm. yeah, you travel with black folks, <laughs> you, you see some stuff, you know, like, and, and I always tell people now I've, I've changed policies. I've put behavioral policies in because we're hurting people. Mm -hmm. And, and I, when you travel, you take you wherever you go. So it doesn't shift who you That's are. Nice. Right. And I've, I've just seen a lot of deep, deep pain. And, um, and so for me, it, it kind of became like, well, this is ridiculous. I'm taking people to travel, but they can't even relate to human beings effectively because they can't relate to themselves. So like, you know, that, that became less and less interesting to me because now I'm building these relationships for you to be out acting a fool in these streets. No, we're not going to do that, sir. Oh, you realize it had to be like a whole yeah. holistic process, like internal um, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still think you need to see more, yeah. right? Like you need to expand more. We need to be outside of these boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, but we are going to do some work. And and hopefully this new air, that's what I like to call things, you know, I need new air. I'll be like, I've been here too long. I need some new air. You know, like I, hopefully that allows you a little bit of a chance to breathe, you know, and so there's still exploration in the work that I'm doing, mm -hmm. um, but it's deeply healing work and spiritual work now. Yeah. Well, what I love is that it's so vast, you know, in that, like you said, it's, it's like, there, there's so many layers to it. It's, it's not one dimensional at all. So yes, it's travel, it's beauty, it's skincare, it's, it's entrepreneurship, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's bridging gaps and bringing people together. And I think that's so important to even understand in the healing process that like it is multifaceted. God, you know, it's not one dimensional. Yeah. It doesn't look like one way. You know, I do Reiki and I train Reiki, but it's not just, you know, you going to a healer and having this experience. It, it really is a lifestyle. It is a whole lifestyle and you're a whole person you know um i think what i see in the black community is a lot of commerce driven healing right and i think that that's healing we need money right i i am always down for us to be making some money and and i'm firmly a believer and i love you about this too is that your spiritual leaders deserve to be okay right like i'm not out here broken these streets yeah. doing this work and pouring in, which is unfortunately the black community really hasn't resolved that within themselves. You know, they, they're fine giving money to like 
you know, their celebrity space and that, uh, you know, yep. other spaces, the, the commercial spaces, but they have a real hard time for the people that pour in to heal us, to build us, to like, to, to feel like there's, there's value, a financial value in that. And, and I'm over that. Mm -hmm. I'm over that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I am definitely very interested in making sure that there's that financial healing, but that alone is not saving us. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have, like what I saw is that it doesn't matter how much money you accumulate. If you don't have a strong foundation and spiritual base, what you doing out here, right? Like it is really, who are you doing it for? You know, we're, you, I see a lot of like, especially a lot of men, you know, you're out here, you're making all this money for what, to, to what end, like what legacy we, we have to rebuild so much of our foundation and it, and it's, it is deep spiritual work that has to happen first. And so to me, it's, I'm trying to make sure that Mwasi is one of these places um, that kind of runs the gamut. So you're going to have workshops that deal with financial development, but you're going to also have workshops that uh, deal with molestation and all the things that are like ailing us in our community that we really have to get to. And you're going to do it in a, on the continent of Africa where, you know, like that, there's something about that continent that is healing for us. And you're going to do it in luxury and beauty, you know, because that is important. That's a part of our healing. We deserve that. You know, um, I deserve good things. I like good things. And um, and I think we've been denied that for a very long time. And so, yeah, that, that's where we're at. Just trying to, you know, make this a full, <laughs> a full lifestyle of, of just recovery, you know, really mm -hmm. is recovery. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm you as you're talking, I'm thinking of something that um Tricia Ross says uh, she's a professor. And she kind of trains on like hip hop and then black community and things to that effect. But she talks about this wound that the re-injury of the wound when we're trying to heal this wound, but really it's not a wound, it's a broken leg. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that re reconnecting that thought of going back to a country that we were, to be honest, let's be real, taken from and ripped away from, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of years ago and going back there to reclaim that. So yeah. when I hear you talk, I kind of hear that connection of, oh, wow, going back and reconnecting to the roots. Yeah, I mean, that's really what Ghana is. You know, Ghana is not a country that I would settle in for a variety of reasons. I think, you know, I've been in, in Africa for a long time. And what I tell people is like at the beginning, when you're first getting on the continent, it's like this idea of the homeland and reconnecting, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's important. That's an important stage to go through this feeling that you indeed are an African, right? And then that that acknowledgement, I think is meaningful. Um, but, you know, it's been 25 years for me. So at some point I also get, I got more sophisticated with thinking about really where I needed to be that was good for me, right? What Africa, like what, what countries are really have a long-term sustainability plan? Mm -hmm. What countries are really looking like, can, where can you really settle? Who has good Wi-Fi? <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like these are some like real, you get real like- <laughs> Like yeah, how can I like, do business here? Yeah. <laughs> right, like what, what country is going the direction that I want to go? And not mm -hmm. just that, I, 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 my latest healer, I have a new healer now in Bali. She's like the desert keeps coming up in all of your sessions. Like that is the place. And I've always felt that way. Like in the Sahara, I mean, really when I said I moved to the Sahara Desert, we were 50 kilometers from Algeria. Like we were in the Sahara. There was 350 wow. people in this town, right? But it was my spot. I love being on a camel. I feel great. Like I feel, I'm like, oh, okay, there's something here. You know, like this is a good place for me. So I think that um, I have gotten, I have grown in how I connect to Africa, but Ghana, I stay there, one, because it won't ever let me go. I swear to God, I'll be trying to run from that country. It never, <laughs> ever wants to let me go. It just calls me back in, gives me a new project, pulls me back into the place. So I'm like, all right, God, I guess. Um, but I love it. You know, Ghana is a place that is a lot of fun um, and also quite frustrating, but a lot of fun. And, but it is the pathway. It's the, it's the gateway for most African-Americans to feel like they can re-enter mm -hmm. Africa. The mm -hmm. language they understand um, and it has the history, it has the slave dungeons, it has the last bath, it has that place. And so, you know, I've been taking people through that journey, taking them to the last bath and, and not 
you know, what I see is people use this kind of as tourism. I don't. This is a, a deeply spiritual return. And we go through a, a rebirth in, in these waters that people were branded in and often killed in. And we go down and we return back into this space. And I think that, you know, Ghana is that place. And I've, I've given in, I even got a whole Ghana card shot. I'm like a whole... <laughs> my leg locked in now and but I, I you know I know that that's where where the spirit world is saying no this is a, a place you need to be um not to live I ain't living there right now and maybe one day but um but definitely a place where um where you need to be and and I love Ghana for that you know I, I know that that is important for us I, I think you're right I think it's it is an important part of um reconnecting pieces of ourselves that are broken mm. talk about like just the practical so for like women who are watching this and they're like wow that sounds amazing but like where do I even get started you know what I mean like how does this you know because you had this experience at 16 so many of us don't and right. some of us still haven't traveled internationally right mm -hmm. so like how do you get started you mean for expatriation yeah or just you know just getting out there. Cause I think you really talked about also kind of being a nomad too, and just going to different places. Right. Yeah. And seeing yeah. what you like. So just even stepping out of your regular world and said, okay, you know what? I want healing on a deeper level. This is not the full thing, but it's a part of my process. Mm -hmm. Where do you, where do you go and how do you get started? And you know, how do you figure out the best places to be for that experience? So one of the things that I'm loving right now is this this surge of like black travel groups, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm not the only one out in the world bringing people around around the world. I see a lot of my colleagues out there doing the thing and that's exciting to me. You know, I love it. I love that people are taking that because it's hard work. It is not easy. It is mm -hmm. not easy, right? Um, Y'all know how it is just trying to get your friends together to take them someplace. Right. Yeah, it, it is not easy. Um, um, so I'm I'm excited about the fact that there are these groups and I think travel groups are a good place to start because mm -hmm. you're not by yourself, you know, pick your travel um, coordinator carefully. Right. And I tell people I'm not everybody's cup of tea because I'm not a museum person. Like I'm not going to be running and ripping and running and going to like every monument. I'm, we're not taking pictures on my trip by by the statues like that's not what I do right I mean it's okay and if that's the kind of traveler that you are then you need to find somebody that is very tourism oriented you know I'm a different type of traveler I'm we can go to the best restaurants though you might sit down and meet one of the uh, ministers uh we might I might find you a husband you know like this might be like my my way of moving <laughs> is a little different um it's more like, let's get in it. Let's be in this country. Mm -hmm. Let's meet the people. Let's hang out, you know. Um, and I'm very much interested in contemporary Africa. So mm -hmm. I will take you through that journey. But we're not going to stay stuck there. This I, I'm only going to do the slave dungeon so many times with you, right? We're going to do that because that's an important part of this experience. But we're going to Sky Bar at 9 o'clock in our best dress right? Like that's what we're doing because there is a contemporary story about Africa. And what I want black folks to know is that Africa is a viable place to live, right? Like that's fly. There's tons of places to go. And you know, we're, we're, I'm not just talking about Ghana, like, yo, Benin, the art scene is dope there. You know, I love South Africa and I wouldn't live in South Africa because I, I think like that's like going to worse than the U.S. Um, when it comes to just their history and that pain that's there. But like Zambia, you want you want giraffes walking around when you have dinner? <laughs> you might want to be in Zambia. You know what I mean? Like there's, I, but I want you to see what contemporary Africa is. And I want, what I like is like a lot of people, you know, I've taken people places and they have re they've decided to live there. You know, I've been able to oh, show them enough awesome. and connect them enough to where they've said, oh, oh, this is viable for me. I, I can make friends here. I can get an apartment here. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my work now is kind of shifting out of that, that this basic tourism and even just the spiritual tourism, but mm -hmm. into really building relationships with governments, um, building the pathways. You know, what we're doing in Morocco is like, you know, we're yeah. building a community. We have 25 bungalows that we're selling 
and you will initially get residency, but after residency, you were really pushing for citizenship, you know, so that you wow. have alternative places to be. And the same thing with Ghana, you know, we have a big movements going on with the folks that are there to get us all, you need other passports. Wow. Yeah, talk, <laughs> about, talk about what you're doing with Morocco and why Morocco? Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. Mm. It's so funny that you asked me that because I have gotten so much criticism and a lot of this is from, you know, it's it's always interesting because it's always from Black people that haven't really been to Africa, but they're deeply, deeply Afrocentric, you know. Um, and I, I'm always giggling at folks when when they're like, I'm like, I will out Black you any day <laughs> in my silk dress and this hat, just so you know. I do not need to be in African garb to out Black you. Uh, and But that is like, you know, I think that they have this idea that North Africa uh -huh. is somehow Arab. Mm -hmm. And a part of that is because you ain't never been to North Africa. So mm -hmm. that's probably it. But beyond that, you know, the experience of Morocco's history is very different. It's, it's unfair. It's an unfair uh, judgment to put it in the same thing as in Algeria, right? Yeah. It doesn't have the same history. It doesn't have the same cultural context. Um, so Morocco is pretty much... Um, there are the European Jews that escaped during the Holocaust into Morocco, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you will have the experiences you would have with any European, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the Arabs that came and colonized, right, um, religiously. And, yeah. and even that experience from a, from a colonization standpoint, um, yes, it was colonization, but also the way Islam spread through Morocco is very interesting. You know, it wasn't all by force. People really mm -hmm. took it on, right? Yeah. Um, we, we know um, that Islam spread in a variety of ways. Um, and then you have the Berber, which is the majority of Moroccans, which are Africans. Mm -hmm. The Berbers are descendants of the Touareg. The Touareg are descendants of the Sudanese, the people, the Sudan, the land of the Blacks. You know, these are African people that are triple colonized. And it's important that people understand the history of particularly Morocco. And I, I talk about Morocco because I find um, I love it there. Like, I, I feel like um, it's a, a very interesting place, especially, you know, Marrakesh and down and south and the Sahara. It is deeply African, deeply, deeply, deeply African. Mm -hmm. um, and they will tell you, I am not Arab. <laughs> I am not a European. I am a Berber. I am African, right? Like they will quick fast. But, you know, but, but it's not branded that way, right? Like a lot of people do think of it as Arab. It's, it's just, it's the branding. Yeah. And I think that there are the European Moroccans, right? And the Arab Moroccan that, that steal the proximity to whiteness. You know, this is a product of colonialism. And let me tell you something, you know, when you think about the politics, uh, let's just be real. And, and Ghana, which is the black is the black folks, right? You have a, a, a president who's building the largest cathedral in Africa and the largest statue of white Jesus. So like, what, what are we talking about here? We, colonialism is colonialism. You know, <laughs> white supremacy is white supremacy. The things that have happened to us has happened to us all across the board. A Moroccan, a, a, a triple colonized Moroccan and their issues with blackness or anti-blackness is not any different than you know a Ghanaian with the same type of of understanding of whiteness so so we're all in different stages of getting free right and what I find in Morocco right now is there's this big pushback like um you know French is no longer the language they're pushing to get Berber in the school so now Ooh. Berber this is after a century like forever wow. that Berber is now being taught in the school, right? It's a, we're all pushing back to regain who we are, right? And that is happening in Morocco, like it's happening in Ghana, like it's happening anywhere else across the continent and the diaspora and Black people. Um, but I chose Morocco for the reasons that I said before. I'm practical now about Africa. I am looking at where do I want to settle where, you know, I look at the long-term plan. One, I love the king. I think that um, he's a Pan-Africanist. I've mm -hmm. seen him um, make decisions around Europe that was like bold as hell. And I'm like, I like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell them to go home, you know? Tell them to go home. You know, like, I like that about him. I think that there's like a, a deep Pan-African spirit that he has. And, um, and I like the idea that, you know, when you talk about development, 
you know, mm -hmm. they're putting together, they have the largest amount of solar energy, you know, throughout mm -hmm. Africa. They have, they're putting, they have windmills. They're thinking about, you know, the, the long-term sustainability plan. And when you're picking a nation to live yeah. in, you need to be thinking practically about the long-term sustainability of being there and that your investment in this space, your social investment, your real estate investment, that those things are going to work for you in the long term. And I think that Morocco really opens up um, the doors and it is six hours away from New York. Which is dope. Yeah. It so is a plane 25 hours no, to go somewhere. It's, yeah. It's a straight plane ride. So if you need to get back to your family, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it could be the same for people living in Mexico. Like I understood mm -hmm why a lot of my Black Freedom yeah. Colony people stayed in Mexico. I have a lot yeah. of people that are still living there because of the proximity to home. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, you asked me earlier, like, what do you tell people? Look, ain't nobody telling you to like give up your citizenship. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have to, what, what is it in the, in the, in coming to America? Like, renounce your, you don't have to do any of that. Like, keep that passport. Yeah, it's strong. You know? <laughs> it's got power. Yeah. You know? <laughs> You want all the benefits of what yeah. America offers you. That is the, the, your passport is probably the best gift you got from the U.S. Mm. Keep that. So you don't have to think about it as like, I'm throwing away everything, but see what it feels like when you spend a month out of the U.S. See what your blood pressure is. I had spent, it was, you know, right before COVID, my blood pressure, I had been in the States for a minute because, you know, I was working on something. I wasn't traveling as much was 184 over like, I mean, it was ridiculous. My doctor was like, you're gonna have a stroke, right? Yeah. Like you're not, you, this is not okay. Girl, I left and lived in that Sahara desert in Africa with the feeling that I get when I get to the continent. I came back, my blood pressure was 128 over 80. They were pushing all these drugs. I, mean, I was like, I don't need your drugs. I just need to get the hell up out of here. <laughs> and <laughs> I did. Right. Travel is your medicine. Yeah. It, it, there's, I think that what I'm, what I want to encourage people to do is, you know, we were not, we're used to this. We've normalized this life and, um, and it isn't okay. Right. There, there, the health, our health outcomes show that it isn't okay, but we, what else can you do? And I always tell people like target, target is what keeps people here. It is target. It is target. It is like the, I, I call it the target syndrome because it's easy, right? You just want to go to target. Target got everything you need. You just roll up in Target. You could drive up to Target. You just pull, get all the stuff. Look, you, you don't even have to go now. Instacart. <laughs> oh my God. Like Target is but it it lulls us into this acceptance of what is unacceptable, right? Mm -hmm. And and I personally am not hopeful. I think that the foundation of this space is what it is, and I think that this is. Um, I've I've always been critical and thoughtful around democracy. I've always thought about it as a fallacy. I think that it is a. a um, it is, it is a non-reality, right? Uh, you know, I think that America, you know, denounced the kingship and aristocrat life for worshiping corporations and celebrity, right? I, it's just a different king. You got a different king and queen over here. And so when I'm, you know, I'm living now in a kingdom. And so I think a lot about democracy now, right? Like, what does that mean to me? What does that look like? And what what's the differences of living in a kingdom versus living in a so-called democratic society? And and to a certain extent, you know, Morocco is democratic as well. They most of these places have duality in that. Um, but I think that what I'm realizing is there's something more honest about the hierarchy, I think is a natural state of humanity. I don't, you know, there's every text that we have, every spiritual yeah. text says it's going to exist, right? So if we think about it in that way, a king has a different incentive. They want to be loved by their people. They want to be remembered by their people. There's an incentive to be good. There's an incentive to be like to do right so that their people worship them and love them. Right. And I think that there, when you think about it in that way, it kind of translates differently. And I feel like I felt that during COVID. I felt community in a way, right? That was really interesting. That definitely wasn't happening in the US. Um, you know, I didn't have to fear 
that if I got COVID, that they weren't going to treat me in the hospital and let me die because I'm black, right? There's these, just these, this certain space of um, the king already owned everything. <laughs> What's he chasing? That's <laughs> it. It's this, it's this nation. You know what I mean? So I think there's a, it's a little bit more honest. You yeah, know, I think, great I think, point. Yeah, I think the hierarchy point. is more honest. And, and I'm enjoying it. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying this, um, this space. And uh, yeah, you know. Uh, when deep. your blood pressure was up, what do you think some things that, uh, I mean, I feel like I know the answer already, but I'm gonna ask you because I wanna hear it from your own mouth. Uh, what were some things that you felt like were raising your blood pressure? What were the things that were triggering that? Um, you know, I mean, obviously racism is the first answer, right? Like that, that's, that really microaggressions and racism. And I created a pretty good bubble, right? Like, you know, black people support me. Like I, my money is made. I obviously, because I talk all kinds of shit publicly and I could not do that if I had white employers, right? Uh, that would not be the, the case. Um, but, uh, I think beyond that though, right. American life is void of some things. It's void of rest right? It's void of levels of peace, you know, and, and you can create it and you can find, but there's also energy that you can't escape, right? Um, I feel like in, um, with like living in Morocco, I have support. That's normal, right? It's normal to have people help. And that's at every level of life. People are like, oh, it's because you have resources in a country where people don't. No, if you are poor in a country, you have help. There are women that gather around you, especially in Islam, right? Islam has a system in place of support. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I think about it because we have been trained here to think a certain way about it. Like, you know, even the nuclear family, it's a farce. It's the most ridiculous way to live. It is the most stressful thing on families. Your families don't make it because you live alone with another human that's supposed to be responsible for everything. You have no support. You know, my, me and Solana have been living with my, in community, Solana's my community baby, my parents are my co-parents, like, but that is how most African societies are, right? The parents are out working, making a living in their thirties and forties and fifties. And the grandparents are raising children and the children have wisdom. They have, they have all of that being poured into them and they have support. Um, you know, I was, I, I saw this girl on um, Facebook and she wrote, you know, um, basically the assessment was like, because she's a real mother because nobody helps her with her kids. And I'm like, oh baby, but you're supposed to have help. Yeah. I'm gonna pray that you get help. Yeah. I'm gonna pray that you have a community of people that support you. I'm gonna pray that your child has more than your influence, right? And but we've been brainwashed to think that there's it's an honor to do stuff by yourself. You know, this very deeply individualistic space um, is a detriment to. It's not who we are. It's why we're not thriving here. It's not who we are. And it were it works against us all know? the time. I yeah. mean, I say that all the time. I say it takes a village to raise a dream. And you know, and I look at where I am and how I got here, and all of the people. Like I always think about, like if I if I was on the stage accepting my award, you know what I mean, and all the people that I would have to thank, and the music would go off before I would ever be able to thank everybody who has helped me because there are so many people who have helped me. Um, but that's because I love ease. I will tell anybody all day, I'm not about that life. I'm not trying to do anything hard. And so I don't have a problem asking for help. Mm -hmm. Um, none at all. No shame. Where <laughs> so many people do, like you said, like we don't live in that culture. It's not a part of our culture to ask for help and to accept it. And there is a badge of honor to say, I did this by myself. I got here on my own. No, you didn't. And you never do. And you know, I mean, I, when people say that, I just got to laugh at them. Like you never do. There was somebody <laughs> along this journey that got you there. You know, like even ways that you don't recognize, like now that I'm, I'm really thinking like, whoa, like I am creating a full community. Where did this come from? And I had to really think like my great grandparents bought a hundred and something acres, 160 something acres from their slave owners, right? 
slaves. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? We are, our family, I have seven generations of my family alive. Wow. And when I think about we're organized, we got Facebook pages, we got business pages, we pay dues in our family, we have mm -hmm. a, a, a president of our family, we have a, a committee that does the family reunion every two years, you know, we take care of our land, we have days that everyone is responsible to go clean the land, you know, to, to do that, and I, I was like, oh, I, grew, I, I, this year I'm a Texan, so like, I grew up with this, this is who I, I'm rooted in family, and my people that I'm sure never had an inkling that the, one of their children, right, would be in Africa trying to create the same type of structure. But my family gave me this. My parents taught me this. You know, I've always had community. My parents have always had my back. You know, I, I could not do a quarter of the things I do in this world without having had that space. And I am successful because I had support. And I'm thankful and grateful that I've had the support that I've had. And I just, you know, I realized like it's, it's rooted in that. I'm sure my great grandmama <laughs> didn't think that, you know, like that's what she was doing, but she set me up for success. She set me up and to, to help other people understand that, that, you know, the North, the North is different. And I always tell people that like, Yes, I've lived in Connecticut for the majority of my yeah, life, and I'm right? Like at this point, um, yeah, like, so I I left Texas when I was 12, but I'm a Texan and I, and I know because my values are so different from people that grew up in the mm -hmm. North, it, you know, these people here are a result of people that ran away, that were running singularly, they were by themselves, right, trying to rebuild alone. Mm -hmm. um, and so their fit, how they understand the world, how they understand family was, I mean, it was an es essential struggle for them to figure out how to do it. I don't come from that. That is not my cultural context. And it's not how I move through the world. And I realized like I've been, God has really put me um, as a custodian to help people rebuild what that looks like, because I had it, because I, I have it. I have it right now today. <laughs> you know, um, and it's, it's the, it's the best, that's the better way to live. And I, I don't have any problem saying that. And, you know, it is the better way to live. And I think Africa really has, there are things that we bring to Africa that they need, right? Absolutely. We are, we are definitely, we're chosen to have this experience because we had, we have healing to give, yeah right? Um, at the same time, Africa has healing to offer. And I think this reconnection is so deeply critical from both sides and we're struggling through it. You know, people that are really, really on the continent doing this work, um, you know, we're, we're struggling to, to work with each other and to understand each other. Um, but when it works and it's working for me, I have beautiful, beautiful relationships on the continent, people that have literally held my hand and walked me through doors, right? Um, it's working and it, it's, it's, it's the work of our generation. That's what I think. Wow. It's a lot, it's beautiful. Um, I think, I, I think there's so many lessons um, that women can pull from this at whatever level you're at, right? If it's, if it's at the base, like you're just kind of baby stepping your way in, or if you're, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt and you ready for your next levels, right? I think there's so much to learn. And I think ultimately, you know, what, what I walk away with um, is, is that it really is all about one, defining what works for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like whatever that is, defining what works for you and immersing yourself into that. Mm -hmm. And so you've literally created, you know, communities because you understand that that is important for you and that works for you. And mm -hmm. so much now I'm going to create it so that other people can walk in and feel this, too. Yeah. And so yes, black whatever, people. whatever for you, like whatever yeah. it's about, about you first and then extending that out. Yeah. And you're going to need it. You know, what I tell Black Americans is you're going to look for the Black Americans because you're going to need them. You're going to need them. You're going to need to have people that come from your cultural context. 
You're going to need those people on the ground that can help you navigate. And it, you know, like, you know, one of the things, again, once you've been on the continent long enough, and although I, I understand myself as an African, I know I am deeply American and I know what that means and what that looks like now in a different way than before, um, is, you know, you're not ever going to be them. And that's okay. We're our own thing. We're our own tribe. And that always happened. You know, this ain't new. You know, people were constantly merging and creating new tribes. There were there, the uh, tribes that exist now weren't always in existence. People were creating new things as new things happen. We're our own tribe. And, and so when you go, like a, what I see a lot of Black Americans struggle with is that they have this desire for acceptance. And sometimes it's subconscious. They don't even know that they're looking for this. And that's why I think um, Ghana is always my hardest trip for a variety of reasons. Cause Ghana be working against you sometimes as much as wonderful as it could be, be working against you, but for a good trip. But beyond that, people are looking for acceptance that they don't know they're looking for. So you we don't have, have it here. You don't have it. So they they have this subconscious desire that yeah. you're not going to get Yeah. that. And that is the truth of it. When you get to the continent, you know, they're going to, they might say, you know, welcome home. It, it's a, it's some of that is um, commercialized, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of it is real. Some of it is like, you know, we see you kind of a thing. I don't think all of it is, um, is fake. I think some of it is real, but the reality is, is you're not going to be a guy. You're not going to be a Fulani. You're not going to be a, a earway right? Like you just are not. And that will always leave you. Africa is deeply, deeply, deeply tribal. The same way Europe is deeply, deeply, deeply tribal, right? You're going to be what you are, which is an African-American on the continent of Africa, where you belong, where you deserve, where they, you know, even Africa is, is thinking about reparations. Benin has a reparations program for Africans of the diaspora because they were participants, right? So there's there's a deep conversation to be had about that. And then you have to you have to realize like, oh, I'm not, I, I don't go to Africa looking for acceptance. I'm not looking for, you know, but I know I deserve a seat at this table. Mm -hmm. And I know that I like at any immigrant, I'm gonna negotiate my space. Mm -hmm. And I know what I bring. And and I think that that there's and it, it you know like Again, I'm 25 years into this and I'm doing very particular work, but I think that um, that this will be a point of conversation for anyone if you're on this journey looking to leave America, right? And um, and figuring out where you belong and how you belong and what these experiences are. But I've seen people really go through an emotional turmoil with that feeling that they weren't accepted. And I'm like, no, you're misunderstanding it. Yeah. And and you need to reevaluate what you understand as acceptance, what you understand as your role. So, um, but when you and that do, is the healing work, like that that is your internal work. And then once you accept yourself, you yes. know you can show up in any of these spaces powerfully because you already have that acceptance. Oh my God! Like let me tell you something. The the people that I sit, I'm like, I don't know why y'all have me sitting with the Secretary of State of this country. I'm just a little black girl from Texas. I really don't understand why I'm at this table, but I'm here and I'm going to do what I do. Right. Um, but you have the, the, what I talk about is black Americans have a cultural capital that is that it, it literally is better than money. People mm -hmm. want you everywhere. They are interested and intrigued by you everywhere. If you utilize, if you have half of some intelligence and some drive, <laughs> right? Now you got to have a little bit of intelligence. Like some people don't have that. And then I don't know what to tell you about that one. You got to have a half a bit of intelligence, a little bit of drive and that black American swag. Cause we got something special. We got yes, something that yes. nobody else in this world has. And it is literally consumed by the world. I have been, I remember being on the back porch in, um, I was in Cape Coast in the jungle. And I'm just chilling. I won't tell you what I was doing, but you know, I was chilling. <laughs> I'm rocking in my little rocking chair. And I hear Jay-Z pumping out of the middle of the jungle. The You know, like you, you have to put those kind of experiences into perspective. We are everywhere. Oh. Right. And people are, have, have 
And I think there, there is a conversation, even in Africa, where people try to diminish who we are. Mm-hmm. But we, if, if you, you move in the world with that clear rec- reclaiming of self, and you know that you're a new thing, and you're here to do something for this world, particularly for the continent, you will move powerfully. And, but, you know, I move, re- I respect culture. Mm-hmm. I respect the space that I'm in. I negotiate my space. I don't expect you to just let me have a seat at the table because I exist and I breathe. I bring value to the places that I am. Um, you know, like, you know, everybody curtsies to the men in the room. I'm a curtsy to the men in the room too. I'm going to do my little bow and like, I'm going to, uh, elders there, I'm going to get on my knee. You know, like you do the things that are required of you culturally and mm-hmm. people will work with you, accept you, you can move. And, and I think that I've just really learned how to move through the world in a way that um, has just opened. I mean, people just really open doors for me. I, I always tell the world just, I, I, I'm everywhere by myself. Like now I have a husband, so, you know, it's a little different. I'm moving through the world with him, but, um, you know, I was by myself and the world, there's always somebody that just wants to love me up and take care of me. And there is, doesn't matter what country I land in by myself as some, somebody is going to befriend me and make sure, take me to their mama and feed me. And like, you know, <laughs> it, does, it happens every country there, every country I got some kind of family there, you know, and it, the world really opens up to you when you realize your own power mm. and, and really, and respect the power of others. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm, I love the world. I really do. I love this um, experience. And I don't know that you'll know yourself if you don't leave here. Mm. You know, you really get to understand yourself wow. more clearly outside of the United wow. States. You know, I hope y'all heard that because that's that. I mean, that was a whole sermon anyway. But you don't even know yourself until you leave here. Yeah, Ooh. you're always seeing yourself through white gaze here. You're seeing. You're always living on the periphery of a society here that you mm-hmm. belong in. That's yours, mm. right? That you built, that your family built. You know, um, when you're abroad, people engage you as you. Mm. You see parts of yourself that you didn't even get. You don't have an opportunity to see those parts of yourself because America doesn't give you the opportunity to see those parts of yourself, right? I feel like I just really found me in, in these really beautiful, beautiful ways. And I, I credit you know, I credit those folks in Bali. I credit those people in, um, God, every country that I've ever been to, people have just really um, done some beautiful things. I see where <laughs> we're getting to the husband part. Yeah, we were like, we could talk all day. Like this could be like, this could be episode one, two, and three, um, for real. Cause there, there's so much richness. Um, there, there really is in depth, but we, we do need to wrap up, but Jessica okay. has some questions. She has okay. some questions. She know the women going to want to hear. So <laughs> and that was, and that was kind of my point was like, I, yes, we have to wrap up, but I would do want to sneak in these two questions. Um, okay. Wrap. Um, just- so one was, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, you, let's move into the question actually about your family first. Uh, you talked a little bit earlier that saying that your, your parents will be a little, uh, sad to see well not a little they will be sad to see you leave and you know there's going to be tears and things what would you say to uh, women out there that that's the reason why they aren't leaving or why they haven't left yet it's because they are hearing from their parents or family oh you can't go over there you can't leave or are you just gonna leave me you know what would you say to them to help or children them? like you like yeah. their children have to start over yeah. and right? let's be clear my parents ain't sad to see me leave my parents are sad to see my child leave child. They, <laughs> I could I could go on <laughs> that's it just leave her here you can go do whatever you want to do, right? Like that, it's not me. (laughs) No, you know, here's the thing. There are, you have to decide who you are in this world. Some of us are here to push the envelope forward and you have a, a mission on your life and you feel it. Those folks that are watching this podcast, they're watching it because they're thinking about it because it's in them. That seed is there. And you are the one that's meant to expand your family. You are the one that is meant to to expand the territory of the people around you. And you have to decide if you are brave enough to take that on. And that will mean disappointing people. That will mean leaving people, but it's not leaving them. It is also expanding their territory. You know, like I, when I think about um, the letters, you know, like 
people that I don't know, people that have watched me just through social media, you know, live my life, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm a regular black girl, chunky and, and roam over to the world. Like I look like you and, and it makes people realize like, oh, like, I have the possibility to be to to be grander, to be more, and that the world has these opportunities for me. And you have to decide that that is enough for you to take these chances, and and that you will sometimes bring them along, mm-hmm. and you sometimes you won't. I have family that will always. I mean, my grandmother used to be like, "Baby, you don't know those people. <laughs> that's a, you don't know those people. <laughs> you know, like." And I, and I, and, and that's okay that she's not going to be the one that's going to come. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish that she had lived long enough to see this because I think she would have come. And I think that there, you have to decide if that, if that's in your ear, if you're watching this podcast, cause, cause it's calling to you, you know, mm-hmm. that's God, that's a mission. And there, there are some of us that are chosen to, to expand and to get, get people. So you, it is hard. And like I said, like, y'all, you don't have to give up your citizenship. Right. You can come back. Go and come home, go back and forth, figure out dual citizenship. You know, if you can work from home, figure out how to, you know, spend time in both. This is the, the problem is that, you know, we've been raising this, this super duper Christian dichotomy of like 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 life is a dichotomy like like there this is not just two options we're not it's binary life. <laughs> this, this is not you you can live a lot of things you can create whatever life you need you know I have a young husband and I have a young child and like at the end of the day he needs to be home he still you know needs to be with his family so we're still figuring out okay well June and July and August we're going to be in, at home. We're going to, you know, be back in the U S and, and we're going to close our retreat center. We're going to build this life around what, what you need. We're going to build this life around, you know, what we need. And that's what you do. And it, it's, you just have to imagine it. You know, people need an imagination, imagine it, create it and just build it. You know, like that's, that's the answer to that question. All right. Well, this is a great segue. Cause you mentioned your husband. <laughs> How did you meet your husband and how did that all come? Because all these single women who are like, I don't know how to date or how am I going to meet somebody if I leave? Yeah, so that's important. Yeah, well, leave because the hardcore reality for Black women in America is that you're probably not getting married if you stay here, right? If you want these relationships, if you want a husband, a person who's been raised to be a husband that wants to be a husband, then you probably need to move around this world a bit. Right. So I'm going to put that on the, on, uh, I, I just happened to end up having being married to a black American man. Um, but not because that was came easy. Like, you know, that was hard. And I know people are having hard, a hard time. Black women are having a hard time in the U S and, and I think a part of that is that, you know, we aren't raising marriage minded men and we are raising marriage minded women. Mm. I'm not sure what you do with that. You know, um, if you're not going to be willing to leave and to kind of spread around and figure out what that looks like for yourself. Um, But uh, I met my husband in Mexico during the Black Freedom Colony. And I mean, I wasn't thinking of him as a husband at all. You know, Um, it was I thought he was impressive. You know, I was deeply um, impressed by his um, spiritual space you know he took the shahada at 12 he grew up muslim but he took his shahada for himself at 12 you know without his family by himself and there was like this very deep spiritual grounding um he was um really led by community in a way that i just wasn't seeing from a lot of men at all you know like black women out in these streets you know i tell people like you, you can talk about gay black men all you want as not being men but when i'm out protesting i see black women and gay black men I see them showing up, you know, and, and I don't see that a lot from our collective, you know, men. And so, um, I was impressed by that. I thought that that was something refreshing and different that I hadn't seen before. And I invited him to participate with, um, the group that I formed in in Morocco. And, um, I had a complicated team in Morocco. (laughs) That's how I'll say it. I had a complicated team and, um, and I, he just stepped up. He stepped up to offer the support that I really needed and um, and was deeply invested in community in the way that I was and really loved Black people the way that I love Black people and um, and just was truly devoted to, to Allah, 
in, in, a, in a way that I had not seen in a very long time. And, you know, when um, he kicked his his game or whatever, he'll say that he didn't, but he did. Yeah, he did. Uh, he uh, he kicked some game, but but you know, one day we were working and he kissed me, and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what's going on here? But I had to like kind of think about my what I wanted, right? Like I thought, oh, I'll take a lover, you know, I'm good for that. Child, mm-hmm. you know? Very mm-hmm. very. Uh, and dynasty. honestly, that's where a lot of women have gotten. It's just like I don't want to call it settling, but it kind of is. It's like I can't get with everything that I want, so I'll have a lover or two yeah, yeah. But I, mean, I also think I'm a little bit for me it was kind of like a little you know exp- I was exploring the world you yeah know, like seeing what was out yeah. there and dating and 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 that was a thing like you know where there's these weird standards in the U.S. like Africa mm-hmm. like I don't I don't feel ugly I don't feel you know out like not the standard I don't feel like you know men covet me I'm I'm I have no problem I no, mean, and, not a and, and that is a good thing, right? Like, it's like, Jessica's just, always like, how are you getting this man to do things for you? Because I know who I am. Yes. And they yes. know who I am. Right. <laughs> but, you know, on the continent, there's space for all kinds of Black women, right? There's space for all kinds of looks. And I think that there is, we've really let this um, this white idea of of just beauty and life that we really let it uh, seep into our culture in a way that the exotic is Mm -hmm. the thing, right? And then regular black girls that are beautiful and smart and thoughtful and and badass get overlooked in a way that I think is, um, is sad. Uh, But I, you know, that's how I met him. And, um, and initially I thought it was just going to be, but you know, my husband is deeply Muslim and very thoughtful about what is required of him by his dean mm-hmm. and marriage. He was marriage minded when I'm uh, another thing that I was deeply impressed with when I met him was very marriage minded. And, um, and here we are. Wow. Wow. Well, I, you know, I have the comment on what Ava Laura said. So <laughs> here's the thing. I think that you, you have to surround, we talk about community and things like that. Um, the way that Ava Laura moved, I was like, what is she? Oh, oh my gosh. Like, and she's like, here, sit down. No, he's paying for it. I was like, what? what? But I don't know. I, to, I think I need to know. No, she's like, no. What, what do you want to eat? <laughs> yeah. But also to that, I mean, that's something that you learn really fast living on the yeah. concept. Let me tell you something. I'm not holding a bag if there's a man around. I'm not dragging a bag. what I look like? <laughs> like you really learn how to be soft. You know, yeah. now it's, it's popular yeah, this whole soft, movement, to be yeah. soft life, right? Like that's, this yes. is the new, t- the new term. Yep. I've been, I've been on some soft life. I don't know. This is like, it might be new I never call it that, it's, but. It's, it's not new to me. Yeah. But I also have a dad that, you know, you know, I, I we giggle now because, you know, my father really um, is an amazing man, but also just really loved on his daughters yeah. and his, you know, what I saw, you know, yeah. we still put the bags at the end. My daddy is 70 something years old. You know, we put the bags at the end of the, at the end of the staircase and he, uh, my, dad, my dad's car. still washing our clothes. I mean, this is what yeah, I think, you know, he's still, we go but you got a, still washing the clothes. when you got a dad that really has poured in to your life and shown you what manhood is, you know, the difference. You know, and, and I so think that my case, right? I did not have, I didn't have that. And y'all want to work too hard. Stop yeah, it. y'all want to do it all. Oh no, I got it. I got it. I got it. And I'm not and, trying to work at all. And, and you're not giving space, right? You're not giving <laughs> space for men to have have a role, have a job, have. Oh a, no, I learned you know, that. It took me years yeah. to learn that, though. But I learned yeah. that eventually. Like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> why am I the only one you know but it was like well this is what we did right and it's like yeah no this needs to switch let's let's change this up right but But it's the same thing it's the same thing as like not understanding that you're supposed to have support yes yes absolutely Absolutely. right 110 absolutely I I do feel like in Africa because I have help right I'm able to do a lot more. It's why women can be having babies into their fifties. I was, you know, know what? I was just about to say that because it's normalized. Like you have 
a nanny, you have mm-hmm. a housekeeper, you have a driver, like that's a part of the culture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and even if you don't have the resources to have that, you have a community of women who are pouring it's into you. Yes. Right. Um, and you know, in Morocco, like, yeah, first of all, I, there was another black girl that I met she had ended up getting pregnant and having a baby within the COVID time period in Morocco. She couldn't leave, right? Mm. So she had a baby in Morocco. First of all, it was $1,000 to have this baby. She was in the hospital five days, a thousand US dollars. She had her baby and people like they, pregnant women in Morocco, you know, Islam in general, just there is a, a deep, deep respect for mothers. Yes. Uh, but um, I mean, they, they, they wrap you you know, they, they, they rub you down. They make sure that you have that. There's people that's going to feed you. There's, there's Mm -hmm. just a, a, and it's, it's ritual. It's something that's built into the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that um, we have to recover Mm -hmm. for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just here, they act like, oh no, (laughs) two days. Let's Mm -hmm. go. Let's start Mm -hmm. packing up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's a care. We, there is, and, and again, I feel like there's just a lack of care in American society, you know, um, and I like care. I like to be cared for. I like to care. You know, it's a big part of who I am. I love <laughs> pouring into the people I love, um, but I like receiving care. Yes. And, and so, and I think that, you know, when I think about my husband, like he's just a very, I didn't have to teach him, you know, things. I'm not like, you know, I remember being like, huh, oh, watching him with like all these bags in the airport and I'm on my phone. <laughs> but those are things that, you know, I think Islam gave him a script and he take to, takes that script seriously. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, Islam creates a marriage contract. You talk yeah. about these things you have. Um, so I, you know, I'm on. I, it's literally in the Quran. It is literally there, but it's also a deeply feminist text. There is a it lot is. of protections for women. There and, is. you know, you are equal. You know, one of the things, and, I, and I'll and i wrap this up because I know that, um, but it was a big part of why I chose how I chose for me, the husband that I chose. And I think Islam, and I really like African Islamic countries. I, I love mm-hmm. Senegal. You know, I think if I wasn't in Morocco, I'd probably be in Senegal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I like the way that 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 space feels. You know, like in Senegal, you you have to have equal, men and women in their in your government like a man can't run you know these these are things that are set up by islamic law um which i i love and yeah so this is how we end up thank you for saying that too i think even though you know we're not necessarily talking about islam but just giving it a different perspective from an african islamic versus you know Arabic or yeah, uh, I don't know what they do or something like that, like yeah. Sharia law. Because I'm, I'm yeah. always saying like that is not Islam. No, that's I don't not know what they're doing. I don't know what they doing. And that's the version that we get in America, and we mm-hmm. don't understand. There's a whole like is Islam is just as much as part of us as Christianity, if not more, because Africans were Muslim. Mm-hmm. It was stripped during slavery. Mm-hmm. That's a whole yeah. other conversation. I know. <laughs> we'll have a part two on that one. Because I have a lot to say about that. You know, this is a, a very interesting journey. Um, I don't think that I would have, uh, I think I'm, 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 my first husband was also Islamic. I loved Islamic spaces. This has been a long journey, even before I met my husband. Um, I think I was able to marry him because I trusted in his faithfulness in God more than I trust in any man, right? Like I, I trusted in his faithfulness. Um, but I do think that there is something to be said where men need structures and the structures that I've seen that hold men accountable, Islam gives you, I mean, when you get a, an Islamic man that deeply believes, that's a true believer, you really are in good hands. Um, and yeah, I wish that that was more part of the conversation. You know, people get caught up on this idea of second wife or third wife, you know? And I'm like, well, does he have enough money to like- You don't need to worry about that. This is even on the table, but even if it was, you know, like, I think that there's a lot to be talked about with that, but yes. So I know we have to wrap up, but yeah, that's how I met my man. And I, I um, appreciate him and I'm appreciating this, this stage in life. 
I love it. I mean, I love that you met him while traveling, even though he is Black America. You met him yeah. while traveling in another country. So, ladies, you may not meet him here. He might still be American, but you may not meet him here. Yeah. So just go. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Laura, I'll let you bring it to a close. But yeah, this, is, this has been an amazing, amazing episode. I mean, obviously, we can go into more into this. Um, I think some levels of trust and things that would be the next conversation I would love to have and discuss with you. Um, how do you just allow that trust to happen, right? So Ava Laura, I'll let you take us out. Yeah, I mean, I hope y'all took notes. I hope y'all took notes. This was so rich. I would ask her her final thoughts, but she doesn't say it so much. Yeah, they- <laughs> like, you just need to go back and rewatch and make sure you take notes because there was a lot, of, I mean, really just very rich conversation. And these are not conversations that we're having. Exactly. Um, so this was a beautiful experience. So thank you so much, Nisha, for being thank here. You thank you guys for having so me. Much. Thank you for thinking of me to be a part of this. I appreciate it. This was wonderful. I had a good time. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you all for watching Black Women Leave America, where women have to leave in order to find themselves. Until next time. Bye, y'all.